Please be seated. Will you pray with me? Father, it is true that you are glorious, you are mighty, that you have a beauty about you that is that surpasses any beauty we could set our minds or our eyes on here. And Father, what I lament in my own heart is the gap that I feel between I know what is true about you and whether or not I'm impacted by that and can express that to you. And so, Lord, what we pray for as those who are mixed in this condition we have of knowing it's true that that is who you are. You are a great God, full of glory, worthy to be praised, and yet here we are, unmoved in our hearts and minds at times, feeling hypocritical as we even sing words like that to you, knowing that it should come from a better heart, a greater appreciation, a deeper more biblical, founded mindset. We long to be with those who do not fight for this anymore, who are in your presence, and what they express to you matches who you are. And so our prayer this morning as a church family is that you would close the gap between our awareness and our affections for you and what you truly are and what you truly deserve. Would you do that? We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles and let's open them to Romans chapter 5 again. Romans chapter 5. We're going to spend one more Sunday in Romans 5, 1 to 11. We have finished going through those verses piece by piece, phrase by phrase, but there's more that I would like to be able to say this morning that we haven't been able to do so far. And so we're going to review a little bit here at the beginning. You remember in verse 1, you see it there, therefore, having been justified by faith, dot, dot, dot. That signals to us that the primary instruction in Romans on justification by faith alone in Christ alone, that it's come to an end. And it's now time to consider the many salvation benefits that accompany this justification by faith. Justification by faith alone comes to the believer by God's grace alone. Remember, to be justified is to be declared righteous with a status of God's righteousness. It's not our version of what we think is the right way to live. It's God's very own righteousness declared over us on the basis through faith alone, not through any works that we do. He justifies ungodly ones, not reforming ones, not those trying to reinvent themselves. He justifies ungodly ones who simply cry out in faith in Jesus Christ, and he gives them his righteousness. And we're saved by that kind of grace, and by by that same saving grace, God also brings to the believer then a treasure trove of other benefits. And the very first benefit that we find in Romans 5, verses 1 to 11, that comes associated with justification by faith alone is the benefit of worship. Worship. And it's not a bland version of worship. It's not a ho-hum kind of worship described here. It's actually called boasting. Boasting in God. This is what God is interested in first. For his grace to produce in the one who believes Jesus Christ and is declared righteous. The believer above all things, first of all, must be one who is caught up in the greatness of who God is and he must fervently worship this God. Three times in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, we find the verb to exult in verse 1, in verse 2, and in verse 11. And it's a very strong word. Uh, The description of it I like best is a worshipful expression of overwhelming joy in God. That's what it means to exult in God, to have a worshipful expression that is 
overwhelming joy in him. It's not a bland word at all. I want you to listen for these three occurrences of exult as I read verses 1 to 11. Follow along as I read. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though Perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And so we can break down these 11 verses around those three occurrences of the verb to exult. Justification by faith gets us to that worshipful expression of overwhelming joy in God through what I'm calling three catalysts. The, and just this is a review this morning. We're just going to run through these three. The first catalyst that compels those justified by faith to boast in God is peace with God. Having been justified by faith, the peace we have with God, it becomes a catalyst that compels you to boast in God your Savior. And the peace we have with God is an extensive peace. That's the point in verse 2. God wants us to draw nearer and nearer to his enthroned grace in which we now stand. We have access or introduction into this grace in which we now stand. He invites us to draw near over and over. We need to see how secure we are in, as we stand in this grace. That's an extraordinary peace we have with him that he wants us to come near to his grace. And it compels us to worshipfully express overwhelming joy in hope. Hope is confident expectation in Scripture. It's not laced with any doubt that we would exult in hope, in confident expectation that one day we will see the glory of God, that overwhelming, weighty, radiant presence of God. So peace with God then acts like a catalyst that leads us to worshipfully express overwhelming joy in hope. By God's grace, we have gone from being his enemy, to those who now have an extensive peace with him. And we're overwhelmed in worship by that. But then Paul shocks us with the second catalyst, remember? Maybe we should just skip it because it's kind of discouraging. No, it's not. It's actually encouraging. The second catalyst that compels us to worship are tribulations in life. Verses 3 to 5. So not only do we exult in hope, in confident expectation that one day we will see the glory of God, we also exult in our tribulations, the pressures on us in life that just squeeze us and take the breath out of us. Paul treats hope in verse 2 and our tribulations in verse 3 like they're interchangeable equals. I mean, we get the first expression in verse 2. We exult in hope of the glory of God. That sounds very good to my ears. I like that, but the second one hurts my ears. We exult in our tribulations? How can that be? The only way that can be is if God has actually designed our tribulations in life to get us to the same hope in verse 2. And that is exactly the point. Tribulation brings about perseverance in our lives, which then in turn brings about a refined character. We grow in our maturity, which in turn brings about hope, the very thing that he just said we exult in. 
And this hope that we get to through our tribulations in life, it will never disgrace us. It will never leave you disappointed. Why? Verse 5, because all throughout our tribulations and all throughout the spiritual fatigue we feel as we fight through those tribulations in our lives, all throughout that difficult refining process that our character is going through, God is lavishing his love out in us over and over by his Holy Spirit, he's doing this over and over in significant ways. We are assured throughout all of that that he loves us. He loves us. He loves us. It's as if he's saying to us, I know you're being pressed on hard in this tribulation. I love you. I know you are growing weary under this. I love you. And I know it's difficult to have your character be refined over and over. I love you. How could you be disappointed at the end of all of that? And your tribulations are des destined by God not to kill your worship of God, but they're designed instead to fuel your worship of him. It's a catalyst that compels you to exult. And this mention of God's love for the one who believes leads Paul to mention then the third catalyst that compels those justified by faith to boast in God. What is it? It is reconciliation through Christ. That's verses 6 to 11. Upon mentioning that love in verse 5, Paul launches into teaching on the greatest expression of God's love for us. It's the reconciling death of Jesus Christ at the cross for us. God's love for us meaning his son's death in our place while we were only helpless, ungodly sinners who were enemies of God, that love stands in complete and utter contrast to the ways we sacrifice for one another. That's the point of verse 7. We might die for one another, but only when we absolutely have to, only when all of the other options have been ruled out, and then we would only do it for someone who appears to us to be righteous or perhaps good. Maybe then we would do it. But I love verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love. He's not demonstrating to us how we all love. He's demonstrating to us his own unique, peculiar love that is not like the way we love. And what is it? That while we were yet sinners, enemies, ungodly, helpless, Christ died at that point. And just when you think the good news of all of that couldn't get any better, it actually does. Being struck by such an uncommon love like that Paul turns us to see the impact that that has on our future salvation from the wrath of God that is indeed coming on this world. In verses 9 and 10, Paul has a much more than argument. Verse 9, much more than. Verse 10, much more. And his point is this. If God reconciled us while we were enemies through the very costly death of his son, will he not keep his friends safe by his son's life? When judgment comes, if he reconciled his enemy, won't he keep his friends? That's the much more than argument. If Jesus died to achieve our reconciliation, if he died to achieve that, all he has to do is keep living his resurrected, ascended life at the right hand of God to make sure we're safe at the coming judgment. That's all he has to do. And if that is indeed true about our reconciliation while being enemies, then you can see how this reconciliation through Christ is a catalyst that compels you to worship. Verse 11. So these are the three catalysts that compel you, the one justified by faith, to boast in God, your Savior. It's peace with God. It's tribulations in your life. And it's reconciliation through Christ. Now, having refamiliarized ourselves with the passage, I, I want to bring to you this morning three implications from it for us, okay? Number one, I want to talk to you about the eternal security of the believer. 
the eternal security of the believer. If we are to take God at his word, in Romans 5, 1 to 11, regarding what he says he did through his son's death to save those who believe, then we can only be encouraged by this passage as believers in Jesus Christ. There is nothing doubtful written here. There's nothing questionable here about what God says that he does when he saves sinners. From his holy, all-powerful side of things, from his inability to lie, from his inability to be uncertain, he says he justifies the ungodly by faith. That's not up for debate. From his holy, all-powerful side of things, from his inability to lie or to be uncertain, God's word says that he just, the justified ones have peace with God through Jesus. That's not doubtful. That's dependable. That's certain. He says that we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we now stand, verse 2. He says that. None of that is questionable or debatable from God's holy, all-powerful side of things. He's not uncertain. He's not lying. There is even nothing doubtful about his design for your trials or tribulations in your life. He says he uses them this way to get you to hope, and therefore it is. There is nothing questionable about whether or not he gives his Holy Spirit to those who have been justified, verse 5. That is dependable. It is certain. There is nothing doubtful or uncertain or debatable or questionable about the timing of Christ's death uh, for those who are ungodly and and sinners like us. From his holy, all-powerful side of things, from his inability to lie or to be uncertain, there's nothing up for debate in regards to whether or not those justified in his blood will actually be saved from the coming wrath of God. It is certain. There's nothing questionable about Christ's reconciling work at the cross being an actual current possession now for us. Verse 11. From God's perspective, from his all-powerful, holy inability to lie or his inability to be uncertain, Based on what he says that he did to save sinners through his son, we can conclude that those God saves are eternally secure in him. The whole argument of Romans 5, 6 to 11 is once he saves them, they are always saved to the end. Let God be found to be true and everyone else to be a liar who says something else. The one who believes Jesus Christ, according to what God says that he did through Christ, that one is eternally secure. God, listen, God cannot lose one. God will not lose one. If God was able to do the more difficult salvation achievement of dying while we were his enemies, then certainly... The easier salvation achievement of keeping his friends all the way through to the end will be done. So Romans 5, 1 to 11 is a great passage that puts on display for you the eternal security of the believer in Jesus Christ. Let's add to this teaching on eternal security Another important teaching. Number two, the assurance of salvation for the believer. These are two very important teachings or doctrines in Scripture. And listen, they are not at war with one another. They are friends. They love each other. They hold hands all the time. The assurance of salvation for the believer. In one sense, for one who believes this unmovable, unshakable salvation that God says he achieved through Christ, 
that one who believes it can be assured he is saved. Right? If God says that this is the, what he did to save sinners who believe his son, and you say, I believe that, your assurance of salvation can begin. And it has somewhere to go. There's good reason to be assured of that salvation. Your assurance that you are indeed saved, it depends on you believing these salvation declarations in Romans 5, 1 to 11. Let me give you a contrast. If you or your church say that you must believe and do good works to be saved, you are at odds with what God has said he does to save sinners, and so you cannot be assured that you are saved no matter what you think, no matter what your church says, no matter how you feel. Your assurance that you are indeed saved, it depends also it depends on you believing the right truth, but it also depends on how your life matches up with more declarations from the same God. This is true, that you can't be assured you are saved unless you believe these salvation declarations made by God in verses 1 to 11 of chapter 5 and others like it. But there is more scripture, more declarations that God has for you to help you be assured that biblical salvation has indeed come to you. You see, this is the foundation of assurance that you must believe justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And it's all by grace alone. It's the foundation. This is where assurance of salvation begins. But this is not where it ends. There's more. Like what? Well, just maybe turn a page and look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. How about this sanctification declaration coming in chapter 6, 1 to 2? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6, 1 and 2 must also be considered by you to accurately measure your assurance of salvation as well. Listen, the God who made these unshakable, unmovable salvation declarations in Romans 5, which are not up for debate about whether or not he did them, he built on top of these, inseparably so, sanctification declarations in Romans 6 and following. And these sanctification declarations are as unquestionable, unshakable, they're as doubtless as the salvation declarations in Romans 5, 1 to 11. They're not up for debate either. To believe the salvation declarations in Romans 5, 1 to 11, but then not believe the sanctification declarations in Romans 6 and following is actually a huge assault on your assurance of salvation. That biblical salvation has indeed come to you. And so you must also measure yourself, you must measure your profession of faith by sanctification declarations also in imperatives equally as you do the salvation declarations of Romans 5. So at the very foundational level of salvation, at that foundational salvation level, as your belief aligns with and corresponds to what Romans 5 says, well, your assurance that God has indeed saved you begins. And you must Add to that also what God revealed in Romans 6, 7, 8, 12, 13, 15, and other New Testament passages. As your practice then, as your living also aligns with and corresponds to what those passages say, you can be even more assured of your salvation. Why? Why? 
because what God says is true about everyone he saves and sanctifies is happening in you. And so you can be assured. Listen, salvation declarations in Romans 5, they are the foundation. They are the beginning of God's great work. Inseparable from that salvation slab is God's sanctification structure that he firmly built on it. They are inseparable from one another. You can't take the structure off of the slab. You can't take the slab out from underneath the structure. To divide them would be to divide the architect of them. And you can't do that. Let me help you by maybe saying it this way. The unquestionable God who said he made peace with us through Jesus' death is the same unquestionable God who said we must not ever continue in sin so that grace might abound. The unquestionable God who said his son's blood establishes our justification by faith is the same unquestionable God who said don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you would obey its lusts. The unquestionable God who said his son's death reconciled us to him while we were yet enemies is the same unquestionable God who said don't go on presenting the members of your body as, uh, as to sin. The unquestionable God who said he will indeed save believers from the coming wrath through the life of his son is the same unquestionable God who said, having been freed from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Those are just statements from Romans 6. And so, the more your belief and the more your practice that's built on what you believe aligns with these unquestionable, undoubtable declarations in both salvation and sanctification, the more you can be assured that God has indeed saved you because your life matches those declarations. Your life matches, it corresponds to, it aligns with what God says he does when he sanctifies the ones he saves. So what happens to the assurance of the one who tries to maybe separate what's not supposed to be separated? For the one who might profess to believe that God made peace with him. But that one is still content to continue on in sin. That one's profession becomes questionable. Listen, God's declarations don't become questionable. That one's profession becomes questionable. For the one who might profess to believe that Jesus' blood establishes his justification by faith, but if that one still lets sin reign in his mortal body so that he obeys its lusts, well, that one's profession is questionable. God's words are not questionable, but that one's profession is questionable, and so forth. Salvation declarations, listen, Salvation declarations like that salvation slab and the sanctification declarations like the structure bit, built on it, they are divisible only if, only if God says they are. It doesn't matter what I think about them or you think about them or if we wished they were divisible. They're only divisible if God says they are. More importantly, they're only divisible if God can be divided, if the architect can be divided, and he can't be. The more your belief and the more your practice, or we could say the more your belief or the more your practice do not align with these unquestionable declarations in both salvation and sanctification, then the more questionable your testimony is. And the less you can be assured that God has indeed saved you with what the Bible says salvation is. 
Why? Because your life doesn't match what he says he does when he saves and sanctifies believers. Listen, we live in a very interesting day. We live in a day when all it takes is for somebody to say, I'm a believer. And the rest of us are like, why? Who am I to pr- pr- protest that? He says he is. The question is, is that the way Scripture talks about it? Is it not? Listen, your word, your profession about what you believe is very, very, very important. But your words are not sovereign. God's words are sovereign about what he says he does when he saves sinners and sanctifies them. And your life must match up with what he says happens when he saves a sinner. Your words need to line up under his sovereign word. So eternal security is from God's side of things. What he says he did to save sinners through faith in Christ's death, that is unquestionable. It is certain. It is secure. And let God be found true, and everyone else who says anything different, let them be a liar. By the way, that's from Romans 3. Assurance of salvation is from our experiential side. And you know what the problem is in all of this? Not one of our brothers or sisters in heaven right now um, is lacking assurance, obviously. So what's the problem for us? It's indwelling sin. Our sin that still indwells us. It's our indwelling sin. And listen, sin is always deceitful. Sin, your your indwelling sin that remains in you never comes to you and says, okay, uh, uncle, I won't lie to you anymore. It never says that. Sin only knows to do one thing in me and in you, and that's deceive you. When God saved you, believer, he transformed you. But sin wasn't transformed. Sin didn't become less sinful. And you must have your eyes wide open. And so from our perspective, we need to be very careful about indwelling sin because it can deceive us at times. And so what has God done to help us? What has he, well, first he's told us what he's done to save sinners, praise God, but here's what also he has done. The more your lives align with what God says must be believed, And the more your life aligns with how he says a sanctified life looks like, the more assured you can be that indeed that amazing work of salvation, it's come to you. It has. But the more our lives are inconsistent with or in contradiction to what the gospel says must be believed and or it becomes in contradiction to how the gospel says we must live, well, then the less assured we are, that God's saving work has indeed come to us. Our assurance of salvation, it might rise and fall as we fight against this indwelling sin in our lives. What God says he did to save sinners never, ever moves. But my experience and assurance can fluctuate depending on how closely my life matches what God says he does in the life of those he saves. Two important implications to think about from Romans 5, 1 to 11. Let's consider the last one, number three, the primacy of worship in the believer the primacy of worship in the believer. It's telling that once Paul finishes the gospel's teaching on justification by faith alone, that the very first benefit for the believer in the gospel's mind is boasting, boasting. 
justified believers are meant to be, first and foremost, fervent worshipers of God, joyful worshipers of God through Jesus Christ. Let me give you a, a sad illustration. Wives, moms, perhaps you are, unfortunately know this illustration, but all day long you labored and nobody in your family saw you. You labored, you, 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 you went to the store, you picked over every possible uh, item to find the best. You, you came home and you labored and nobody saw what you were doing. They weren't even aware of what you were doing. They were just out living their lives away from home and you were laboring, sacrificing over and over and over again to make a feast for your family so that when they come through the door, they have something to, to sit down and enjoy. They walk in the door and the only thing they see is the feast on the table. They have no idea of what you've done in your sacrifice all throughout the day. Now, if they eat it, and then just push themselves away from the table without a comment to you on what they consumed. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? It's heartbreaking. It's borderline criminal. Just ask your wife or your mom. And that kind of unawareness, that kind of unconcern has to be avoided at all costs in the believer's relationship with God. Can you imagine the unfortunate testimony to the world when professing believers in Jesus Christ live without thought to what their response should be to the God who sacrificed for us, as he did in his son, to provide the salvation feast we live on? For us to live life so on the run from one thing to the next thing to the next thing without any time to pause or to reflect on what this justification by faith cost God's son. Without any time to reflect on what it means for us and what it compels us toward that not only impoverishes our souls, it robs God of the glory that's due his name. I don't know if you can identify with that illustration uh, of the family who scurries away through the dinner and from the dinner table without much thought to the one who prepared it. I don't know if you can identify with that. I feel like I unfortunately do. And so here, Romans 5, 1 to 11, is one of those precious places for you to come in Scripture if you feel that your heart has been too unaware of God your Savior, or you, you've been too unimpressed with what your Savior has truly accomplished at the cross in his death for you. If you feel like you've just these days been running, and maybe this just describes the, the way you feel like your life is, if you have just been running headlong down the path, barely able to keep your feet under you because you're, you're just going so fast and all you're doing along the way spiritually is just nibbling on stale breadcrumbs, you haven't been boasting probably in your Savior. You just haven't. So, come back. Come back to Romans 5, 1 to 11. Come back to other passages like Romans 5, 1 to 11 in your Bible and slow down and reconsider the salvation feast that is here for you. Take the necessary time to, to pause your life. To reconsider the peace with God that you have through faith in Jesus Christ. Slow down and reteach to yourself again God's intent for your tribulations in your life. How, how he intends so much good to come out of them in your life for you. Retrace the lines of Christ's reconciling work for you in his bloody death for you at the cross, how costly it was for him. And what it means for your unwavering safety with him all the way through his coming judgment. 
thoughts. Slow down, church. Don't leave those contemplations until you can express something of an enjoyment of the Savior who saved you. This is God's design. This is his first benefit that comes associated with justification by faith. That we exalt, we exalt, we exalt. God's design is that we would move about this world first and foremost as fervent boasters in him. If we enjoy and participate in all of the other benefits that are going to come to us in the chapters to come, but we're not overwhelmed by him, something's wrong. Something's wrong. We missed it. Slow yourself down if you need to. Refamiliarize yourself with these types of catalysts for worship that flow out of your justification. Let me help you think about this from another angle. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 21. In our enemy stance against God, fists raised, white-knuckled fist against God, in that enemy stance against him, we would not open our mouths to honor him or give thanks. Romans 1, 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. We would not open our mouths to do that. But what we did open our mouths to profess to the world, verse 22, is professing to be wise, we became fools. We'd open our mouths about how wise we were, but we would not thank God, we would not honor him as we were in our free fall into foolishness. Turn over to 129. And and in that enemy status against God, we had no trouble using our mouths to gossip, verse 29. And we had no trouble slandering, verse 30. And so turn to chapter 3, verse 13. This description of what our mouths and our tongues and our lips were like is right. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's us. That was us. Worst of all, every time we heard anything about the gospel indictment against us, like these kinds of things, We opened our mouths in protest against God and a protest against the indictment against us. And if you remember, one of the gospel's primary tasks, if it is going to save you and be the power of God for salvation, is that it must close that open grave called your mouth. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law for this purpose, so that every mouth described just above would be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. But listen, upon justifying you by faith, in Christ alone, God does not intend to leave you there in silence, or that you take a vow of silence in the world. You're just an undercover Christian. There's nothing of the sort. But instead, he intends that you open your new mouth, given you, and with it, you exult in hope of the glory of God. One day, I'll see everything that's weighty and impressive about God. And his intention is that you would exult in his brilliant design for your tribulations in your life. And his intention is that you would exult in him who will keep his friends safe all the way through his coming wrath. Listen, what a transformation your mouth has gone through, believer. Not as your heart, because your mouth can only speak out of that which fills your heart. But the gospel had to first shut my foul trap (laughs) 
the gospel first had to bring you into silent agreement with the bad news indictment against you in the gospel. But then the very same gospel opens your mouth, gives you a new mouth that will exult in God, our Savior. To be justified by faith alone and to be silent is inconsistent with Romans 5, 1 to 11. And we'll remind ourselves what we know to be true also. Like all other New Testament passages on worship, this text also does not limit the thought or the idea here of worship to our corporate singing of songs together. Of course, what we do here, what we just did, what we will do when we're done, Lord willing, uh, if the sermon ends in a couple hours, is we are going to sing again. And that is indeed worship. But worship is much, much broader than that. Nor is your worship of your Savior reduced only to your personal private devotions with the Lord when your Bible is open and when you're praying. That is worship. That needs to be going on. But worship is so much broader than that as well. Boasting in the Lord is to be a perpetual way of life, a perpetual attitude that you take with you everywhere you are. So then if that's the case... What will it take for your heart and mind to be so fueled? To be so fueled like that so that you can at any moment be ready just to boast in the God who saves you. What's it going to take? How will this affect the time you set your alarm to get up in the morning? How does this affect the time you choose to go to bed? How might this change what you expose your mind to before you go to bed at night? How will it change what you first expose your mind and your heart to when you wake up? How could you better use your commute time? What could you listen to? What might you talk to God about while you drive? How might this change the way you view your lunch break? Could this be enough motivation to even make you rethink how much margin space you have between all the stuff that you do? Might we even try to create more margins between the busy events of our day so that we can soak in a little more throughout the day texts like Romans 5 and other passages? Why would we do that? Because we're legalistic people. That's why we do it. No. Why do we do that? Has not God changed us? Does this not resonate with your heart and your mind, believer? And I just don't wake up exulting in God. I don't go to bed just exulting in God. But I recognize my life needs to get to a place that it's not yet. And by his grace, with his help, don't you want to get there? So what is it going to take? Do you need to change? Do we need to change? So that we have more time to soak and when you step back into the busyness of your life, oh my goodness, there will be, this world will be different that you live in. How might this change your commute home? What if you walked through the door of your house into your family, overwhelmed by Joy because of Christ's saving work in your life rather than walk through the door overwhelmed by the events of the day. What difference would that make? How might this change the way that we actually use our dinner time together? Might we actually even eat dinner together? And what would we do while we're there? 
And yes, how should this affect Sunday morning? Better question, how should this affect Saturday nights? Listen, you can't control the absolute tempest that's going to occur in your minivan on the way to church. It's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. But if you've done nothing to fuel your heart before that or for days and that happens and you walk in here and the next thing you know, you're, I can't even mean those words. And here comes communion. Wow, I'm so not ready. Does anybody feel that way? It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. There are two kinds of humanity in the world, two groups of humanity in the world. There is the noisy, self-boasting, gossiping, slandering, God-protesting collection of humanity out there in the world. And then there is only one other kind of humanity in the world. Joyful, overwhelmed worshipers of Jesus Christ. And the only difference between the one class of humanity and the next class of humanity is the free gift of God's grace that reigns in our lives. It's not because some of us really figured it out and we're pretty sharp people and we separated ourselves away from them. We didn't separate ourselves away from them. God's grace came and we are different. And that grace is the grace in which we stand and that grace reigns supremely in our lives and we need to worship this one and open our mouths in praise of him. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, would you please today help us to close the gap between where the coldness in our heart might have us and what you are truly worthy of and what you designed for us as justified ones. We see what your word calls us to and we lament how content we are to live in the lowlands and to crawl in the dust when you have such heights of worship intended for us. Father, would you come and meet each one of us where you have us, where we are this morning, and would you help us to bring change? Lord, we can't change even ourselves. We need your spirit's indwelling power. We need your grace. We need your Bible open in front of us, dwelling in us richly that we might become a little more fervent in our worship of you. Lord, we are not looking for merely emotional response. Emotions are deceitful too. They come and they go, but what we are looking for is a mind that is set on scripture that understands and we're looking for truth and declarations about your salvation and declarations about sanctification and we want truth to lead us forward. God, would you lead us forward with the truth of your word that we might be able to exult in hope of the glory of God, exult also in our tribulations, and exult knowing that we have this reconciliation that will keep us safe all the way through to the end. Please achieve in us what only you can do, that your church might be alive in love and in worship of you, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.